All right, it is 1 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time. We'll kick off um, the webinar today. Welcome to the Dream Collective Leading from the Living Room webinar series. Uh, we've got an incredible number, record-breaking number of participants um, joining us on the webinar today. So we're super excited um, to kick off the conversation. To uh, everyone who might not, might uh, have dialed in the first time or who might not know uh, much about what we do here at the Dream Collective, we are a global diversity and inclusion consulting firm. And our mission really is to see more women in leadership and how we do that is through partnering up with organizations to help them either attract, retain, or advance female talent across the world. And today I'm so thrilled uh, to be on this sort of journey and this um, conversation with you. I am Sarah Liu, I'm the Managing Director for the Dream Collective. And with me today, I've got an incredible speaker who really needs not much introduction today. Um, she is Miki Tsusaka-san. She is the Managing Director and Senior Partner of Boston Consulting Group in Japan. Um, and in fact, a true BCG veteran um, who uh, had a working 20 years experiences um, in BCG New York. But I have to say that what impressed me the most is not her impressive CV, is the fact that um, through different connections, I had someone reaching out to us and saying, oh wow, Sarah, you're uh, interviewing Miki-san today. Um, she's actually my friend's mom. And my friend tells me all the time that she's like a badass. And I'm like, wow, I don't know what better <laughs> compliment a mom can get from, you know, your son when you hear that. So I'm really looking forward to some badass, you know, conversation today. <laughs> and that's very much the spirit, you know, of the conversation. What I think people find most useful and relevant from our webinars is that it's raw, it's authentic, it's insightful, and it's actually about real solving real problems and real issues and real insight. So uh, with that being said, please join me in welcome, uh, Miki-san. Hi, Miki. Hi. Hi, Sarah. Thank you so much for the very warm introduction and the surprising shout out from my son. Um, <laughs> as you said, it may be the highest compliment one can get from a 21 something year old uh, young boy or young man, excuse yes. me. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Sure. Yes, yeah. and so how we will set up today is that Miki san will actually take us through a short snap um, snippet of the consumer sentiment research that has just been conducted and concluded by BCG. In fact, I understand that it's so hot off the press, it hasn't been officially released yet, is that right? That's right. Yeah. We are probably releasing it now in a week or two. We're actually watching how the virus progresses actually in Japan as well. As I'm sure you are all seeing in your local markets. But again, happy to talk about whatever you'd like that I can uh, contribute to the conversation about today. Great. So for this webinar today, um, for the first about probably six to eight minutes, we'll do a um, deep dive into the consumer research and Miki-san will take us through it. And for everyone who is tuning in, please make sure that you share your questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. What we do is that we try to make this as interactive as possible. So we actually answer your questions and address them throughout the session and we don't wait till the end so that there can be real-time responses to your question. So please make sure that you fully utilize the, the function and we will make sure that we address your question throughout. So um, without further ado, Miki-san, I'll hand over to you to take us through the research. Okay. Let me screen share and make sure this is coming across okay. Let's yes. Slideshow. Great. So again, Sarah, thank you so much for the warm introduction. I'm really excited to be with your group and all your followers. Uh, and uh, I understand they are from around the world, coming from 10, 12 countries. So very excited to address you all. I'll try to keep my opening comments brief to just set the context of the main agenda today that I think you were invited to listen about, which is the consumer sentiment in Japan. But I do have some uh, as consultants, we travel with PowerPoint. So I do have a few PowerPoints that talk about Japan in the context of the rest of the world. I'll do my best to shut up and make it more interactive and answer your questions. So with that, um, if I may just set up how we're thinking about the whole COVID-19 situation, it, this framework of waiting for the, the disease curve to flatten 
entering a phase of fighting and then figuring out where to go in the future has been a very helpful framework for us. I think all of us as individuals were very affected by it in different stages and different speeds, depending on the country you're in. And uh, we're certainly in fight mode right now uh, in Japan, where we've been fortunate to see lower numbers than anybody expected, although we all assume that the numbers are understated in terms of the actual progression of the disease. We have a ton of models. All of this is on our website but looking at epidemic uh, projections around how the disease progresses across each country in the world, macroeconomist data, category data, et cetera, et cetera. The piece I'm going to share with you today is on this bottom right-hand side around consumer sentiment. Over a dozen or two countries across BCG have been doing this research periodically, and I've been leading this research consistently for every two weeks. Uh, starting in April, just to get a sense of what the consumers are feeling about all of this in an attempt to understand how they are fighting and when they will feel like the future has arrived. So with that, there's a ton of people we've talked to every week. Uh, let me get your attention on this slide on page four. So what's unique about Japan, perhaps, versus other countries is that we have no legal authority to shut our country down. We were a bit late, but once we did, you see that the number of people, 95%, 94%, et cetera, have voluntarily just decided not to leave their homes and not to interact with others as other countries were also under lockdown mode. But under soft lockdown, we've achieved essentially the same kind of behavioral impact. If you look at us in the middle, comparing across multiple countries around the world, everybody still is very negative around the economy, most of all, on the bottom. And you know, the Chinese are a slightly ahead of us in terms of feeling like the virus situation is, is not quite over and they are the most optimistic and they were the first, so to speak. But you'll see that across the board, the sentiment remains very cautious for understandable reasons. This is a slide about- oh, so, on that, yeah, go ahead, um, Sarah. Just, I thought that was really interesting because the audience today, actually, we've got um, participants from over 12 countries dialing in, majority Australia and Japan, but also have people from UK, US, Canada, India, New Zealand, Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, China, mm -hmm. and even Nigeria, you know? So I think what might be really interesting is to dig a little bit deeper around what we're seeing globally. Are there trends um, in regions or what has been surprising from what you've uh, indicated mm -hmm. here? So uh, probably two months ago, we were all looking at China because they were the first to be impacted, but they were the first to start recovering. And what Chinese, from a business perspective, what Chinese businesses did to fight uh, during that phase where everybody was locked down was fascinating to us. So if you are in um, you know, the hotel business or the restaurant business and people aren't coming your way, but e-commerce has completely exploded again in China, mm -hmm. those employees were all restaffed, repurposed, retrained mm -hmm. to fill the jobs in customer call centers and helping with digital business growth. Mm. So China was a bit of our that benchmark around how companies fought during that time to get back to the new normal and getting themselves ready. Mm. Um, given the majority of your audience, I believe is in Australia, mm. my Australian partner and I, it's on our bcg.com Aussie website, we did publish a report about six weeks ago and Australia, Japan are actually featured side by side, so you might find it interesting. I found it interesting, we're actually quite similar. We are both similar and there are uh, prospects around the conservatism of the recovery speed of the economy, uh, but also the need to feel um, safe and to be quite careful. And I know your lockdown was probably a little more stringent than the ones we have in Japan, but the behavioral elements were quite the same. And we also looked interestingly at the time at that kind of period where it isn't normal, who do we trust or do we not trust? And there are uh, an interesting examples in the Australian report that I would urge you to look at on companies and brands that built loyalty. I'm mm -hmm. sure all of us, right, every day are getting emails, mails, texts from our favorite brands, partners, mm -hmm. places we usually go to. Mm -hmm. And those, hey, we're still thinking about you notes, actually yeah. do work. Um, and so, you know, companies are continuing to do that across, but I do think it is a very different trajectory by country, by sector, by demographic, 
across any of these countries. There's a very specific story for each one. And one of the things we're trying to do is draw out commonalities. But with that, one of the other commonalities, if I may, this is now Japan data, is to look at, well, who's most concerned? And understandably, in Japan, you see the people in the middle ranges here who have a lot more debt than not are worried about their future. Now, our unemployment rate is at an all-time high of 2.6%, okay, because <laughs> we're, we're not having babies. I have three kids. The average uh, Japanese household has one and a little bit. So these seniors are obviously on a, you know, a retirement income, so they're not feeling the financial stress. But the people in the middle, the middle of the workforce is feeling that. And I think we see this pattern across the world, but particularly pronounced in Japan. Um, if we look across the uh, age groups around who is more worried about another round of this, it is indeed the seniors. The seniors are more conservative. And if I cut it by uh, gender, in fact, you'll see women are slightly more conservative and concerned about the next wave to come. The Tokyo number yesterday was 54. And I know many other countries have another zero or even two zeros in terms of daily infections. Yeah. But for us here, that was uh, big news and worrisome news. Mm. Very sorry for this complicated consultant slide, but this is looking again across different economies around categories consumers say they will increase their spending on. And on the right side, in the red are categories people say they will stop spending and the right hand side is a bit obvious mm -hmm. what was surprising to me actually is that japan only has one green dot yeah. um, when we did this a few weeks ago we had a few more greens there is a natural trend towards health and wellness there's a natural trend towards home entertainment these are pretty obvious i suppose you know what do you do when you're stuck at home but i did find it surprisingly unfortunate and conservative that uh, we are um, you know, the least uh, or the most tight in terms of anticipating opening our wallets, even when the new normal strikes. Yeah. The and other, I might actually, yep. I, I can imagine brands um, and businesses might be looking at this in Japan and felt very, I, I think, very sort of jarred and I, I think probably uh, nervous looking at this. So how would you advise brands and businesses knowing that this is the sort of sentiment that's coming out and the the reservation in the market, what can we do as a brand with that information? Yeah, so at the end of the day, strong brands will win and as obvious it is in myself, yeah. weak brands won't. And yeah. if you are number one in the market, you can't stay there high and mighty and assume you'll be number one in a category that might be dying pretty, uh, if, at least for the last six months. You know, people haven't been able to go to uh, entertainment complexes or go shopping in the way they did. Um, but um, I think everybody needs to innovate in thinking about what does that brand stand for that resonates with the consumer. And one of the keys I do think is, you know, jumping on that digital wave much more aggressively than ever before. Um, the left-hand slide is a percentage of retail sales that is uh, uh, essentially uh, online e-commerce. And of course, it's no surprise for some of you from uh, China today that you guys are at the leading edge. And in fact, the numbers actually did spike up during SARS and prior uh, crises that we have actually gone through, which is interesting and perhaps ironic. But the rest of the pack, I've just picked a couple of OECD nations. We're yeah. growing, but not at the rate we think. And we think that we will see a spike. Japan is amongst the lowest in the pack. One of the reasons for those of you from Japan will know this pretty obvious, but those of you that may have visited we have the highest number of retail stores per capita than any of the OECD countries. We are incredibly stored. You know, I'm drinking a, you know, a, a sparkling water from the convenience store downstairs. I have, there are 50 or 60,000 convenience stores. Forgive my convenience store clients. We probably don't need that many. But one of the reasons why e-commerce hasn't progressed in Japan is because the physical availability of goods is so high we're also very used to a very high level of service. Mm. And with all due respect to Amazon or Rakuten in Japan, the UX UI is okay, but it's not a beautiful and gratifying experience. So for those reasons, we have been low. Mm. The, uh, you asked me what was surprising. This was surprising that it is this aggressive in terms of people now saying, you know what? Mm. I've now gotten religion about how easy and necessary 
yeah. e-shopping has been during this period. So even branded products, even apparel, which is lower than 10% in many categories, people are now saying, you know what? I think I'm going to continue. And that, I think, is a positive sign for the brands mm. that have invested in that omni-channel communication to your question, Sarah, about what can brands do. They yeah. have to develop that direct relationship with the consumer. And, you know, yeah. this thing is their friend to stay connected with all of us as consumers that are interested in their products. Yeah, direct relationship. I think that's what we're actually seeing coming out from that with a lot of brands. We've got a number of really interesting questions submitted by the audience already. Okay. Um, and I might just add that we, you know, got like, you know, over 200 sort of people <laughs> on the webinar. So if you have any questions, feel free to jump in, you know, don't wait. Yeah. So we'll make sure we address them. Uh, so the audience has asked, are there any hypotheses as to why consumers are less willing to spend on household entertainment, preventative medicine, takeout delivery in Japan versus other countries? How does that relate to the burdens placed on female to fill those gaps? Yeah, so this is the data from literally two weeks ago, I believe. Uh, yeah, June 12th to 14th. The research two weeks ago had a few more green dots. So that's one thing. There, are in the, there was an equal number of people that said, I think, yeah, I mean, I, I, I will continue to now, you know, go on Netflix and buy online entertainment or, you know, watch YouTube for hours a day, which my, some of my children do anyway. Yeah. So um, I know that this, again, the, to be careful about this data, this is a one-time snapshot of seven, 8,000 people yeah. one weekend, which was two weeks ago. But if you actually look at the consumption, you will see that people are starting to cocoon, entertaining themselves at home. You know, mm -hmm. online alcohol consumption is up uh, at home. Of mm -hmm. course, we're not drinking in the bars and restaurants anymore. And on preventative medicine, there is some data here around general health and wellness. And again, you don't see it at this point in time. But this is the ones that said they would increase their spending. I think Japanese actually have a high propensity to spend on health and wellness. We have one of the largest, again, back to per capita size of the market. Um, we are very much into self-care and we have a huge, uh, both, you know, sort of organic business as well as the health and wellness sector here. So they just may continue to spend, which may be higher than other markets, but you do see some upticks. And again, I think that will depend by demographic. You know, I showed you the data about the personal P&L, people that have more money versus less. You overlay that with uh, women with children without, uh, what kind of income profiles we have. Given the mission of the Dream Collective, it may not be a surprise to some of you, but in fact, Japanese women, uh, the labor participation rate is 70%. It's higher than the US. The most of us work. It's just that we're working um, far below the men in terms of full-time employers, you know, a lot of contract workers and part-timers. So the income per hour is much lower. Mm. So with the little discretionary income we have, I do think that we'll see a pickup. And I'm sorry, I don't know if I have that slide in the back. Let me just jump ahead. No. Um, at the end of the day, I think we're waiting for the new to strike. And mm. this is, you know, a array of data of when do people feel like it's under control and it's very clearly dependent on vaccine development. It's 57%, and this is, sorry, uh, May data, but if I look at the June data for Japan, that 57 has turned into like 71%. Mm. So we're all ho hoping, for those of you who are, that are in the uh, pharmaceutical and scientific community, we are waiting for that. Mm. Our economists and our healthcare experts say, uh, they were sharing a story with me, because we work for about 30 countries around the world too, um, but they were saying that when you talk to the healthcare sector and they, and they say the vaccine will come in two years, mm. healthcare executives will go, oh my God, that, that's just like too early, not yeah. gonna happen. And when <laughs> you talk to the non-healthcare CEOs, they're like, what, two years? That's too long, that's too late. <laughs> Isn't there anything we can do to speed that up? So clearly we're all waiting for the uh, you know, vaccine solution. Mm. And a lot of the things that governments can do, businesses can do, you know, Mm. under control doesn't mean when the government says yeah you can go to the beach or you can go to a restaurant mm. consumers don't believe that it's under control so then the responsibility falls on us as individuals mm. uh, again especially women that are taking care of their family and whatnot to say even if those actions on the bottom of the slide happen mm. you know, we have to be cautious 
until we get to that place on the upper right of the slide. Mm. And actually on that note, because vaccine and treatment, one is out of most people's control, two is because realistically it's quite far away. How can companies help accelerate um, into that future stage instead of getting very stuck in the fight stage? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a big question. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, I think there are some companies that are still in the, the um, uh, the very first stage, right, of those that are honestly are having a very difficult time, not able to kind of get to the flattened part either. We will see and have seen a lot of businesses that won't survive this, despite all the government uh, subsidies and whatnot. So the acceleration, I think, from, from my perspective, because I'm a consumer research and consumer insight nerd, mm. is actually to, to, to talk with them. I think they have given us a lot of clues. And if I may, maybe I'll skip ahead to another slide. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of things that we're observing right now. Mm -hmm. On the top, from the quantitative data, but also the qualitative data that we've uh, collected from around the world, there is this stuff that's happening on the top that we think will be temporary, right? Mm -hmm. So we are actually, I have my mask. I have this little a mask from a kimono shop in yeah. Tokyo that isn't selling a lot of kimonos, but she's selling a lot of these masks made out of beautiful mm -hmm. Japanese fabric. Um, you know, the emphasis on sanitization or you know, right now feeling like you need to support your local community. These are things that are happening now. Mm -hmm. But when the vaccine comes, when the new normal strikes in X month, those things may start to dissipate. What we're finding is the stuff on the bottom, we believe will stick including things like online behaviors. I really think this time there's been a long enough period where people have been quote unquote locked down that those old behaviors of feeling like you have to go to the store to buy something, mm. I think is going to be changed. And now we live in a global world. Everything is accessible around, mm. you know, cross country and cross community. So the very bottom piece and I, um, mm. yeah written this with sort of a consumer business in mind, but I do think our lifestyles have changed. I mm -hmm. do think that, you know, maybe once and for all, you know, it's like that New Year's resolution where you say, I'm gonna exercise, I'm gonna do good. And yeah. we stop that by February 15th. We've had a long enough period. There is a bit of revenge shopping data that, i sorry, I didn't include. <laughs> I'm gonna, the, the minute the, you know, the yeah. luxury store is open, you know, things were flying off the roof, but it'll get down. So I think that, companies that understand this dynamic of the things that will change versus just focusing on the top part, mm -hmm. which is maybe the way to survive the next six to 12 to 18 months, mm -hmm. but anticipating the investments you need, right, to adapt to that. I don't know how many of you guys are on how many Zoom calls a day. Mm -hmm. I've actually been doing them because a third of my business is actually outside Japan. Mm -hmm. And today I'm in my office, but I am quite comfortable and these work from home behaviors, for example, are here to stay. Mm. We believe, you know, um, you know, the Starbucks folks talk about the third place, about how Starbucks is their third place, right? That all of us can hang. The yeah. fourth place has become, you know, sort of working from home, not, not just being home home. So mm. anticipating those needs, I think is absolutely a critical part mm. of acceleration. I think the other piece across businesses and across governments where that is possible it's collaboration. You know, yeah. one pharma company, forgive me, if they can figure it all out, great. But I think even in the disease and drug development, you see a lot of, you know, competitors working together across borders with academic institutions and whatnot. And we so desperately need more of that. We don't need divisiveness in a country. We don't need divisiveness in an industry. And more that industry leaders can step up to fight the good fight, which is you know, using a different crisis, climate. It was great earlier this year to see, you know, so many of the pronouncements about this is the year mm. um, at the forums like the World Economic Forum. And I've really felt like that was the first time in many years that I've been mm. where people started to take that topic seriously. But again, a single government, a single company mm. certainly can't fix that. So I think it's about anticipating these consumer needs mm. and looking for ways for businesses you know, across the ecosystem to collaborate more. Mm -hmm. Great. And we've got a couple of more questions here. Okay. Um, this one specifically around uh, beauty 
care, beauty care as well, beauty okay. therapy services. Um, given that there was actually no dots in spending around beauty care in the previous slides, um, I mean, what's your point of view in should we reopen or not? Um, Monica's daughter actually has actually just bought a business three months before COVID hit. Um, so what do you have any, um, I suppose, insight that you can share around that category in particular? So it's interesting. Um, I've spoken to a couple of leaders in the cosmetics industry, and this stuff is flying off the, 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 the stores, the warehouses in markets like China. Many companies have experienced growth on the basic routine stuff, right? So um, and I heard an interesting anecdote about how eye makeup is selling better than lipstick because we all have our masks and people are very curious about <laughs> how to take care of themselves above the nose. Uh, seriously, so I, you know, as uh, uh, and I spoke with a CEO the other day who's in the uh, the travel industry, this desire to see the world, this desire to travel. I mean, they're you know virtual tours, but it's going to come back, right? So then it's the matter of what do you plan for in this period? I believe in the category. I do think you know if you are a beauty manufacturer selling in duty free you have to write that business off for the next year because we're not going to be on airplanes traveling around the world. Mm -hmm. But a year from now or a year from now, that demand will be back. And I think this notion around self-care mm -hmm. is an important one. And I think, again, I've seen some very, very interesting innovations from uh, the gym and spa category players because they've had, you know, zero traffic during the shutdowns of how do they stay, uh, you know, connected with their consumer Mm. Um, and this whole online delivery of service or beauty routines is certainly a first step. But, yes. you know, I think that basic human need to want to care for ourselves, the outer beauty and inner beauty, I think is here to stay. Yeah, I agree. And I think, you know, um, even within the category itself, we saw here in Australia, um, the demand for skin care has tripled because people are staying at home doing, you know, like self-care, whereas cosmetic lipsticks has gone down dramatically. Yeah. Um, and also some of the data we've seen as well is the increase for how-to videos around mm -hmm. beauty, yep. you know, um, has increased. So I think a lot of beauty companies are actually, or service industries are changing the model to more education. So that might yeah. be something that's worth thinking about. Mm -hmm. Um, we've got another question here as well. I'm curious to know if there was a question about how people see if COVID-19 is the only threat that changed their lifestyle or work style. Um, I think maybe, Miki-san, do you, is that enough for you to respond on or would you like to elaborate that a little well, bit? Um, so I, I don't know what country the question came from, but I think there are a ton of you know, terrible things happening right now in the world in terms of unrest and divisiveness, which I refer to um, as a business consultant. I won't share my political views, but what's happening in some countries are things that just, you know, just depress me very much. And I do think that uh, around consumer sentiment, certainly, you know, it's hard to ignore all the, um, uh, the reignited uh, Black Lives Matter movement in the U.S. and how that has spilled over the world. Mm. It is, you know, LGBTQT month, and that has also ignited that community. So, mm. per your mantra of you know diversity and inclusion, and it's not just diversity because you have to have the inclusion part to mm. make any change stick. Mm. I think the world has gone through a terrible wake-up call mm. in light of some of the events that happened in the U.S. and that has certainly. Mm. build over and I think there has been a rise of social consciousness mm. and civic responsibility and activity that I think we see particularly in the young generation but also some unexpected maybe older generation as well if we look at the data around engagement uh, again this is the consumer sentiment part of our research but the other parts of our um, what we're calling BCG Lighthouse the economic model that we're trying to build by country by category around the fight phase is mm. trying to appreciate some of those movements as well. So I don't know if that was the question behind the question, um, but I have certainly seen the data and I think that is something, again, that is here to stay. Mm. Yes. Yeah. 
And Miki san, to your earlier question about diversity as well, we'll probably come to that um, in more detail later, but um, are you seeing companies deprioritizing their efforts in diversity and inclusion because the overall spend level budget is tightening across the board? I think it's a business reality that things that are on any line of the P&L, mm. every line is being scrutinized. Mm. So I would love to say people now are doubling down on diversity and inclusion initiatives. I don't see the resources. I think mm. the best I'm seeing is people that were, you know, fortunately already committing mm. to mm. stay the course. And that would be true for climate. That would be true for sustainability. It's across the sustainable development goals. What we try to talk to our customers though is, you know, if you take two steps back, it sets you three steps back, because then it's harder for you to catch up because mm. the world is moving and the leading edge companies are investing. Mm. So I, and there is a positive correlation around doing good things like investing in diversity, like, you know, um, making sustainable choices around, you know, uh, in a company value chain, where the waste comes from and whatnot. We know that companies that talk about it but actually do it perform in the mm -hmm. stock markets much better than those that don't. Now you can talk, we've done some word analysis on annual reports of companies that mention it. Uh, and then we actually looked at results of whether they actually did it. And there's a material, you know, five, 10 point EBITDA difference between the companies that do and don't. And that was a, one of our seminal reports uh, in 2017 or 18 called Total Societal Impact. Mm. and the lack of trade-off between total shareholder return. Mm. So we know the long term, it's a good thing to do. Mm. Completely understandably, and you see it in the news, right? There's a lot of dislocations in terms of people losing jobs. Mm. And I am afraid that some of those jobs are indeed, you know, um, in that p &L in terms of the, the, mm. the investments companies have made. And I hope that if it is now what they have to do, that they will come back mm. and reinvest. Now, yeah. that said, I do think women are such a key part of every economy. You know, no right. economy can run without women. And, you know, perhaps I can share, share a little bit of this work from home data mm. because there are some interesting differences here. So um, Tokyo, Osaka is the majority of our economy. So that's the cluster on the left of people that were working from home. And you see a steady decline um, uh, in the, even Tokyo, Osaka, the big prefectures around our metro markets, and then in the countryside. But, um, and our self-quarantine has reduced, you know, subway or train ridership of two, two thirds, but yeah. now we're kind of getting back to the 50% level. Mm -hmm. I think the thing to remember is that work from home actually really depends on sector. Some jobs you can't work from home because you're in the field, you're in the farms, you're working in the restaurant industry. But you know, so that's just something to remember because we tend to cluster and there's also diversity within working from home. And what does it mean if you're a man or a woman on the left side of this graph and that kind of, you know, sort of white collar ability to work at home job versus those that are not, this impacts us differently. And the right hand side talks about, you know, the percentage of private sector employees that did work from home. And you see that big corporates are able to support that. You know, they have Zoom, you know, dealing with the Japanese government uh, ministers and some of them, you know, they can't, they're not allowed to Zoom from the ministry building, so they have to leave their homes to uh, leave their offices and, you know, uh, Zoom uh, with their private Wi Fi networks, right? So the infrastructure is not set up for everybody to do this. But the men are on the left, women are on the right. This is a question that we asked in terms of um, now, do you feel like you're back to normal in terms of economic activity? And the number was um, uh, how many of these people reduced contact by over 70% in the last period. So we were in room shutdown. And now only about 30% well, on average are saying now they're proactively reducing contact. Mm -hmm. And men are reducing it you know, anywhere from 33 to 19%. But women are still kind of in the mid 50s in some categories, 40s and 30s. Mm -hmm. And you see the employed work from home or peace, right? Where women are still like, yeah, I hear you. I'm still employed. I'm working at home mm -hmm. and I'm not yet comfortable to go back. So I think mm -hmm. engaging that workforce is a critical priority. Mm -hmm. um, if, and again, if they have jobs that allow for them to stay at home comfortably, it's good. But I think Sarah, before 
our call, I was talking to you about um, also how women, when we asked the question about well, what support do you need, both men and women need the infrastructure and the IT to be able to work from home and have, you know, PC setups and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But they also need childcare, home care. You know, mm -hmm. the schools were closed and it was a real burden on women with children working at home, understandably. And uh, if you look at um, the hours of housework our fellow Japanese men do versus women, they are amongst the lowest amongst the OECD countries. Let mm -hmm. me just leave it at that. Yeah. So, you know, they had to be yeah. a mom, they had to be a, a you know, a worker, they had to continue to keep the house, and they also had to be the teacher. So that's yeah. like four jobs, and I think that burden disproportionately fell on women. Yeah. So again, well, figuring out services, you know, people like you helping women, you know, mm -hmm. progress where they are to help others like that mm. of all kinds of diversity. Male, female happens to be one mm. cut of diversity, but anybody that's a bit different and supporting them through this crisis, I think is a real corporate imperative. And how are you uh, personally managing that work-life integration <laughs> during this, uh, this three months? <laughs> so um, I'm comfortably working at home. I will say one of the reasons why I'm in the office is this is the peak of Wi-Fi usage in my home. My husband also has his own business. My son is taking online classes mm -hmm. from college, uh, summer school. So w I came here. Um, but yeah, no. Um, <laughs> I, between Zoom calls, you know, I'm washing the rice, turning on the washing machine, you know, uh, cutting the chicken and marinating it and then going back to another call. And I just asked myself, wait a minute, why am I the only one doing this? Yeah. Um, so I started a more delegatory model, you know, barking orders to my husband, yeah. who I love, and my son on WhatsApp during this crisis. So there's been a little bit of shift of yeah. uh, collaborating. It's uh, the three of us are uh, living at home right now. So yeah. <laughs> I'm glad my son is there. If it was my husband and me alone, I'm not sure what would have happened. But. Yeah. <laughs> and it's good to know. It's very reassuring, I'm sure, for everyone who's on the call as well, to know that, you know, even the managing director for BCG has the exact same issue <laughs> as we do. I think um, this is actually really a time that everybody, you know, collectively is going through very similar challenges. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. No, and again, look, I'm one of the very fortunate ones. You know, I have an apartment that I have a Wi-Fi set up. Um, but, you know, one of the reasons why, particularly in Japan, this work from home situation has been hard is, you know, I talked about the number of physical stores we have in Japan. We also have one of like the smallest houses, living spaces, uh, given how crowded our big cities are. So that um, is, is challenging. I've seen YouTube videos of, you know, great women who are, you know, um, psychiatrists and doing sessions in their bathroom, you know, covering up the toilet and putting a little flower and that's their office or in their closets and all that. You know, we get very creative. I had a, a fellow partner of mine, uh, a gentleman who um, uh, took out his um, Patagonia tent and put it on oh. his terrace for an <laughs> evening call because the kids were all doing their homework and, you yeah. know, the household was loud, but he needed some quiet space. So, yeah, he was in his tent on the terrace. So we all get a bit creative about how I we make all it. of this stuff. Yeah, yeah. Well, that was the most interesting place I've Zoomed with somebody so far, I must say. Yeah. I think you've given a few ideas to everyone on the call today. <laughs> <laughs> now, if you're going to cook, cook three meals and freeze the other stuff, right? Because you have That's to do it, it anyway. So. <laughs> Didn't we have this last Monday? Yes, you're going to eat it again. <laughs> and we've just got another question coming through as well. Over the years, consulting companies have had issues with retaining staff, um, mm -hmm. especially female talent. I think it goes probably back to um, the workforce participation and advancement a little bit. What kind of changes have BCG made to address this? And are you seeing positive results from that? Yeah, so um, I don't think it's just a BCG issue, but has been an industry issue, right? You know, again, the good work that you do. Um, Sarah, with your organization, we just haven't seen women go all the way to the top. And that's just something we've been very conscious of. And frankly, you need to spend resources to fix it back to diversity and inclusion efforts. You have to spend money. You, you know, a lot of us can work hard, but the same people working hard a little bit on the side is not going to change. So we've significantly in every year upped our investment. That's one. Uh, we're business consultants and we're like, again, geeks about data. We monitor ruthlessly 
So mm -hmm. every country, every practice gets a scorecard, and we've been doing that for over a decade. Mm -hmm. And the good news for us is I think, you know, some of those initiatives that we put behind um, the improvement in our numbers has actually worked. So mm -hmm. I just actually saw our people report across um, our firm, and we always do compare different minority groups, men versus women, uh, nationality differences, and so on. And um, we did see that the retention rate of our female staff uh, is at part parity. We also look at, okay, bonuses. How do the people perform? We wanted to make sure that the curve, we have good top performers and those that are, you know, the middle and those that are on, on the uh, bottom. And, uh, you know, we do want to make sure that that shape of the curve also isn't dramatically different. And I can tell you with straight confidence that indeed our, you know, that ratio mm -hmm. has also become uh, quite consistent across the, at least the gender cohorts. So mm -hmm. what have we done? We've done, you know, um, a lot of what you've done is a lot of it first is awareness mm -hmm. for both male and female employees. There's mm -hmm. a lot of training. There's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, dedicated training for women. But there's also dedicated training, frankly, for the men. And I think I was sharing with you, Sarah, um, delighted to see that the younger generation of men are much more uh, conscious around diversity and inclusiveness. And that data is true across the board, across countries, even in Japan. Mm. So engaging the next generation men has been awfully helpful because they are taking more responsibility in the traditional households mm. around uh, raising the family taking care of the house and so on. So all of those things combined, you know, give me confidence. Mm. And yet um, Japan is still 121 out of 153 uh, countries that the World Economic Forum mm. tracks every year. And it just kills me. I, you know, I'm very competitive. I don't like to be 121. Mm. You know, I'd love us to break it into the double digit barriers, but I think that's also a function of how so many other countries have done so much better, right? It's the mm -hmm. consciousness around womenomics, um, uh, as a word that Kathy Matsuya Goldman Sachs uses, who's a very good friend. Um, you know, everyone's doing better at it. So for us doing just a bit better from Japan doesn't get us to the place that we need. Mm -hmm. And But for BCG, back to the original question from uh, the audience, I do think it's a combination, but it's the 360 view of that. And then there's the career after BCG. I'm a dinosaur in this market where I've been here actually for, um, well, you could do the math from my bio. I've been here for over 30 years. <laughs> Most people join BCG thinking, okay, it's good training. I'll be here for a year or two or three. They leave yeah. and they become wonderful alumni. We have 20,000 um, yeah. BCG years today. We have 25,000 alumni. And actually, I'm the chief alumni officer for BCG now. So wow. I'm figuring out ways to take care of them. And again, both the men and women are in extraordinary places after, a, you know, a, either a short time or a long time with us. So mm -hmm. consulting, yes, retention has been an issue, but I think excellent graduations is also part of our talent yeah. strategy because we want people to go out there mm. and do good and follow their passions if they don't want to be a career consultant, quote unquote, yeah. like me. So. Yeah, yeah. And on that point, we've actually got another question that's related to that around like your talent strategy. What are the key selling points used to attract talent into BCG? <laughs> um, key selling points. Um, well, it depends, again, on what stage of your professional career you're in, right? For the, the kids out of college, I would say, this is a great place to be if you have any desire to be in business because it is that 360 experience, whether you spend the two years or three years with us, you'll have a variety of experiences. We are, if I may, amongst our fellow consulting peers, we're the only firm that has continued to grow, grow double digits in the last decade. We've gained market share. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, in a market like Japan, we're number one. Mm -hmm. So you would be joining the best. Um, but in a firm like ours with 50 countries around the world, um, whether you join in a specific office in Sydney or Taipei or Tokyo or New York, the firm is what you've joined. So I do think it's a great education um, and a starter career. If you are mid-level industry experience, but you were a bit frustrated that isn't there more to do, we welcome those mid-career hires, right? If you're in the pharma industry, if your counterpart in the pharma industry was somebody the same age as you, 
when you join consulting, because, you know, premium consultants like us, I guess, are very expensive, you get to deal with people that are double your age. Mm. So there's an accelerant in your career that happens when you join a firm like ours, where our clients are naturally, usually older than you, unless you're, you know, working with Alibaba, Google, and whatnot, Mm. because the average age of the tech industry is so much younger. But for the rest of the world, you are going to be the youngest person in the room as a mid-career hire because our clients are very senior executives that we're working with to help them solve the hardest problem that they could solve on their own. Mm-hmm. So it's a wonderful new career for people that have a industry or functional background that might want to join us mm-hmm. to then directly consult to the industries they were from or maybe open up new avenues of things they want to learn. Mm-hmm. The digital piece is a big one. The world has gone digital, and I don't think we would have ever come out of COVID without the power of the digital tools that we have now to connect with each other, to do the massive analysis that needs to happen and such. But our firm right now is about 35% digital business. Um, You know, if you look at my profile, you know, there's the classic MBA types like me were hired, I think, over a few years ago, we had 500 people in the data science and digital group, we now have 5,000. So we're hiring more than ever. So if anyone's out there and you're interested, please do consider us. But again, that whether you're starting your career or mid-career, I think those are the things. And then there are people that join us very late in life. Uh, We just welcomed a senior advisor, one of my uh, former clients who was a head of a country for a very large consumer company. Mm -hmm. And she's just really excited to now come to the other side and leverage her expertise Mm-hmm. to advise other big corporations or big governments mm-hmm. uh, to move fast. And mm-hmm. so I think with consulting uh, at our firm, you get the diversity, you mm-hmm. get the learning, you get the speed of impact, mm-hmm. and you get that digital education and tools that I think make you a better professional, whatever walks of life you might go thereafter. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thank you for allowing me the mini commercial, but that was not my <laughs> intent today. <laughs> we actually have a lot of questions coming through around like a BCG and actually your personal stories as well. Uh, and we'll make sure that we absolutely allow time for that. But uh, Mickey, so I'm just mindful that might be a couple more insights on your slides that you might want to take us through. So maybe we'll perhaps wrap those up first and um, then come back to the question. Okay. No, I think... Uh, in terms of slides, Sarah, I, I think we're good. I mean, there's, if there are questions about, but I don't know if there are questions about the data around COVID and the recovery, um, I can answer those. But yeah, this is all, I thought we all had about eight yes. minutes to walk through slides. So if I've, you know, bought only 14 yes. slides. <laughs> so I don't have more. more. What, what else can I say um, about the data? You know, you asked me again at the upfront, what, what did I find surprising about Japan? I think I've shared that. Mm. Um, yeah. I, I do believe, what do I find surprising about the, the, the whole world of consumers is that we are actually much more alike than different. Yeah. And I just wish that, mm. you know, we as leaders in whatever sector keep mm. that in mind, mm. that the only way out of this is that if we figure, it, it sounds like such a platitude, but it, I really believe it. You yeah. know, no single country is going to figure this out. No single company is going to figure this out. Mm-hmm. And uh, if I hadn't worked for BCG out of college, my next career would have been, um, actually, I thought I would get a master's degree or a law degree mm-hmm. and join the United Nations. So um, oh, wow. actually, my, my professors all said, no, no, UN is going to be a little too slow for you. Why don't you try yeah. business for a few <laughs> years? Yeah. So my, my roots are in, and, and passion are in actually government and public policy as well, way yeah. back then. Yeah. But all of those thoughts have certainly come together, especially given some of the divisiveness, yeah. the racial divide too, which is the other huge you know, theme around diversity and inclusion mm-hmm. um, yeah. that we've witnessed. And yeah, so right. what yeah. it comforted me to see mm-hmm. that we are more alike and that whatever solution works in one country one yeah. sector is probably very transportable. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes, and also we've uh, got a couple of questions. Uh, that's really interesting, actually. Um, what challenges, Mihi san, did you face as a career woman and a mom when you were raising your kids? Can you oh, give okay. some advice to women looking to start a family while climbing the corporate ladder? Okay. Whew. Uh, 
I don't know if I did it very well. I've had my good days and bad. I just tried to make sure that uh, um, I had more good and bad. Mm. I was uh, blessed by a lovely husband. We just celebrated our 35th anniversary. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. My kids are great. Sometimes they're good. They could be better, but then again, <laughs> you know, that's what it is. So I do think it starts with family. I, well, a girlfriend of mine in the firm said, you know, the key to a successful career and raising family is to find the right husband mm. if you're in a traditional marriage and the right mother-in-law. So I thought that was very practical advice. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the husband comes with the mother-in-law, if that's your, uh, that's your definition of marriage. Um, yeah. I was just asked by a young woman the other day about, you know, whether she should change. She's, a, she's an alumna of UCD. She was asking whether she should take this new challenge in her company or start a family. And I said, well, why is that a or? You know, there's never a good time to have children and babies. Um, there's never a good time. You think you're ready and then you might not be able to have one. Uh, you're so ready and you know like it just happens so I think that lovely event if it happens we're all lucky that it did mm. um, but that said I, I was pretty choiceful I wanted my first child before I became partner mm. so I had my daughter before partner I had my second one as a new partner mm. because that just gives me a sense of you know um, a solid foundation that I knew my career was on track and that was important, right? It's hard to add that to your to-do list when you think you're not doing well at work. Mm -hmm. But I've also loved the word that a girlfriend of mine shared with me. She never uses the word work-life balance. She uses the word work-life blend. Mm -hmm. that, you know, I don't know about you guys, but I wake up with my you know cell phone waking up and you know I have personal stuff and work stuff. So this notion that it's one me mm -hmm. and that sometimes I work, Sometimes I play, and sometimes both, you know, well, work can be a lot of fun and the fun may be very hard if I'm, you know, trying to, you know, run a marathon, which I can't, but so it's the integration. Um, but it is the support that I think I've gotten. I think, you know, as a person, I think I'm reasonably organized, I, you know, reasonably healthy. Um, I'm reasonably forward looking. If I know I have to do something a week from now, I do try to get to it now. I'm, I, I, uh, I've tried not to be last minute on many things. And then there are things I let go. You know, my closet's a mess. I wish I was five kilos lighter. I wish, you know, I didn't have that extra glass of wine, you know, last night or whatever, right? But I yeah. learned to forgive myself. Mm. But most important is the, the support network. When yeah. I started with my husband, my yeah. children are my biggest uh, go-go fan club people now, now that they are young adults and they kind of understand what I do now. Yeah. My colleagues in the firm, it's my clients. Yeah. It's my girlfriend network, which, by the way, I had zero when I came back to Japan after 20 years. And now I'm mm -hmm. so lucky mm -hmm. to have a group of different groups of different friends. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And my parents. Great. Yeah. And I think supportive network is so important. I can't agree more with you on the having the right partner, you know, comments. I think that, you know, just really <laughs> helps women go a long way, doesn't it? And we've got um, another question coming through as well. Um, what advice would you give a young STEM major who is deciding between a career in tech or consulting industry? You might be a little bit biased on that one, but... <laughs> and how are women supported in terms of leadership and STEM at BCG? Yeah. So tech versus consulting, I think you could start with tech and come into consulting, or you can come into consulting and go to tech. Mm. Um, our largest alumni uh, group for BCG is Google. Google mm. has the most BCG alumni across all the companies that I track. Fascinating. Why Isn't do you that think that is? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, Google, I mean, you know, uh, Google is now such a big corporate, you know, a decade ago, or even 20 years ago, they were an interesting startup fish company on the West Coast. Mm -hmm. Same for, you know, the Alibaba's and the Taobao's in China, I think. They, they as I say, take, they mm -hmm. are very happy to take our people once they are trained at BCG. And I think that's a very natural path that I would strongly encourage. But why do Google people hire us? Or actually, Facebook just hired one of my female partners to be the head of her country in Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. I think the tech companies respect the skills that you gain that I spoke about earlier. And, you know, we are only in the business of people. So I do think, um, you know, our firm, as well as others, I think do a really good job in developing those, you know, uh, 
emotional and intellectual muscles we have as human beings in the business world. And I think that's very appreciated. It's very systematic. We invest a lot, not that the tech companies don't invest, mm. but honestly, the 360 feedback, the coaching, the whatnot, if you look at it probably as a percentage of revenue, we spend a lot more mm. because we, we're not selling software. We're not you know, selling product, mm. right? We're selling the services of the great people that come together. Now in the digital world, we're selling apps and we're selling technology solutions too, but that is still, you know, a part of the offer. So I think that's why tech companies are attracted to X consultants and yeah. vice versa. Mm. So, And we've got a couple more questions and we'll make sure we wrap up on time. So I'm going to speak right through those. Can okay. you give us the top three skill sets that BCG looks for in talent? So there's the figure eight, the basics. You need to be yeah. comfortable with numbers, with people, what you imagine what business consultants do, right? So there's yeah. the basics, but a hundred people apply and 1% of them, or one of them gets in to mm -hmm. our, our firm. And I think the ratios are probably comparable across. So there is sort of this interest around business. And even if you're not a, a you know, a quant job, you just have to be interested and we'll train you. So there's mm -hmm. that basic package. Yeah. I do think the second piece is ability to deal with ambiguity. Mm, Again, yeah. if the, pro the client problems were that easy, they wouldn't help us. Yeah. So whatever you plunge into, it's a hard problem and you have to thrive mm. on that. Mm. The easy stuff over and over is not e interesting for you, mm. not interesting for us. That's mm. not when they hire us. So yeah. this ability to embrace ambiguity mm. and think of that as a challenge is important. Yeah. And the third thing I would say is the balance between, I mentioned it earlier, IQ and EQ. We have a lot of smart people in the world. Mm. We also have people that are people people. I just think that that is so important because on the other side of us mm. are the client people and we're trying to help them be better leaders in their organization, whatever function. Mm. So that balance of IQ and EQ, if you're very strong on both, I think those are the best consultants that I've certainly worked with. Yeah, yeah. And I think the last question um, is, a great one. I love this actually. Uh -oh. As a badass <laughs> women professional in a very competitive industry and a mom, what makes a great day for you? What makes a great day for me? A perfect day would be one that I get to exercise. A mm. perfect day for me would be to do stuff like this, you know, to give back to whomever mm. um, a little piece of me to, to, I guess, you know, help others figure things out. And if I can do that, that would be good versus a one long meeting one day. Mm. Um, obviously, the bulk of my day is working with clients and making sure, mm. frankly, that it's not just about being nice to them, but being like the tough mom, right? Mm. They don't hire us to necessarily have us agree with everything. We often disagree with them and have mm. them appreciate us so they can get better. We're not on the front page of the Wall Street Journal or the financial times they are and that's our job and you got to love that mm. and um a day i can be with family mm. you know and i think this work from home stuff has been great i've had more meals with my husband my son my parents mm. zoom cocktails with my daughter in london i think that connectivity is really important so, i know it's only halfway through today and it's so far a good day Yes, I did, yeah. my, I did my morning yoga. Oh, great. <laughs> oh, oh, you see my great. Apple Watch, right? I'm so <laughs> obsessed with like closing my circles and I know it's going to be a long day. So I got it in in the morning. So I'm very proud of myself, but I feel so good. So planning, hey, to your point, planning and be <laughs> organized. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Miki. It's not like that's been honestly a fantastic conversation. Um, and with the questions through the audience, like thanks everyone who has been tuning in for like being such an active part of this conversation. Please make sure that you stay in touch. We continue these uh, series um, with a great insights and uh, great business leaders. So uh, make sure that you connect with us across all the different platforms that's on the screen here. And thank you so much, um, Nikki San, once again, for bringing that insight and just, you know, sharing your knowledge so generously with us. I think, you know, Japan has always struggled with speed to change. And I, you know, really hope that with everything you've talked about, we can embrace this opportunity as an opportunity to innovate, to continue, not slow down, but actually double up and um, accelerate 
female advancement and you know embrace this opportunity to change as individual and as companies so thank you so much Miki Sang for joining us and thank you everyone for tuning in today um, stay in touch and we'll keep connected thank you Sarah thank you everyone thank good you. afternoon <laughs>